Hello, and welcome back to When Bad Things Happen to Good People, a podcast about censorship and the arts. My name's Todd Sullivan. Joining me again this week is Dave Colmine. What up? And today we are going to spoil the ending of, of Mice and Men. If you don't want to know the ending of Mice and Men, the ending of, of Mice and Men, stop listening now. We're going to talk about it. It's an 85 or so year old book. So uh, if, if you're not okay with spoilers on, on something that's 85 years old, then that's your problem, not ours. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing well. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were just cheersing wine and bong loads. Wine and bong loads. <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> Both of which Dave is full of right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to provide coherent conversation Excellent. to a podcast. <laughs> Excellent. He also warned me that he's planning on offending a bunch of our listeners, and I'm I'm eager to see what his what his plans are in that regard. <laughs> oh so. boy, it's not hard. Not to say that you guys are easily offended, just to say that I'm very good at saying the wrong thing. Okay, fun. Um, what are we drinking tonight? We have a we're drinking some wine. Uh, we're we've got a wine o'clock Shiraz. Only the best. Only, Only the, the best. best. Um, I have come around to the idea that like there's perfectly good wine under screw tops. Remember there was a period where like everyone was like, oh, if it's a screw top, it's cheap wine. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think we need to move beyond that kind of reputation. And that's there's, right. There's some really, you can get some really good wine in a box. That's right. In a, in a bladder with a spigot. Yeah. Hook me up. Bladder and spigot. <laughs> Put me the, underneath that. Open yeah. my mouth. But this is a, uh, it's a fruit forward Shiraz bursting with flavors of juicy blackberry and black cherry with a hint of spice. Smooth will with a well balanced finish. Uh, this comes from Vancouver, BC. Noish. Little represent little little known place called Vancouver. You might have heard of. <laughs> uh, and while we are uh, living it up with some some wine and, and bong loads, we're about to talk about some people who are maybe not living it up. They're in the middle of the the Great Depression. Uh, in California. Lenny and George Lenny having a bad and time. and George having not a great time. So when did you finish reading this novella? Uh, I finished it this afternoon. Lucky you, lucky you. I'm now about a day and a half, two days ago. Yeah, I read uh, I read chapter four yesterday, and then I read five and six today. Cool. All right. So we've both finished Of Mice and Men. Yep. Uh, were there men in the second half of the book? There were. How about mice? I don't recall any active mice there there may have been like references to mice of the right. past but but no physical mice there were in no the second half physical mice in the second half boom spoilers have already started yeah <laughs> yeah exactly if you're here for the mice um head home bite. it's yeah it's disappointing from yeah, here on at out. the wrong spot um we pick up in the um the the cabin of the 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 stable boy or the stable buck whose name is uh i keep forgetting his name crooks crooks uh, who is the uh, the black fellow with the crooked spine? Uh, so we open on his bunk room uh, with Lenny kind of lurking around outside. Should we recap real quick? I guess we could if you want to. We could recap real quick. So Curly threw a punch at Lenny. Curly is the jock. Yep. Who has a wife called Curly's wife? He's <laughs> Curly. I think is also the son of the guy who runs this. Correct. Right. So he's kind of got. That clout that comes with that, like you can't really stand up to Curly, although Lenny did, and and Lenny kind of got away with it when he crushed his hand uh, because of the fact that they managed to convince Curly that he wouldn't want the truth to get out. Yeah, Slim did. Slim, yeah, exactly. Slim did. So Curly throws punches at Lenny. George tells him to defend himself. Lenny eventually catches Curly's hand out of the air crushes it into little pieces. And now the next chapter begins on what's his name again? You just said it. Oh, um Crooks. Crooks, right? Crooks. I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. We're gonna We're gonna cut this from the podcast, Todd. Okay. This is where you cut, okay? You're you're <laughs> 
Meanwhile, Todd, boy, it's going to be especially funny if I don't cut this. <laughs> I'm watching Todd, and he's like, he's holding this wine glass against his body like it's his infant, just filling it with the rem- remnants of a bottle. For sure. So this chapter opens on Crooks' yep. place. Crooks lives on the side of the horse barn, and because Crooks has been there a long time, this African American fellow with a crooked spine. He has more belongings than most and more of a sense of space. And because he's African-American, no one ever enters his space and he feels very isolated. And as he speaks to Lenny later, he's stuck out there at night. He has no one to uh, converse with. Once the horseshoes are done for the day, he must go back to this place alone. Which means he has a couple of books and magazines, but not much. Including some adult magazines they mentioned. Is that what they were mentioning there? I didn't totally catch that reference then. I thought that's what they called it, though. Was they not like an adult magazine or a girly magazine or or something? I can't remember what the exact wording was. You'd have was, to find it. But there was, like, you know, could. And he had books, too. A tattered dictionary and a mauled copy of the California Civil Code of the 1905. There were battered magazines and a few dirty books. Dirty books. On a special shelf over his bunk. I th- I suspect that's referring to like adult content and not that the covers were soiled with with some dirt. See, and I just thought they were books that had you know a layer of dust on them. Yeah, no, I think I mean uh, pornography has always been around, and lonely men have always been lonely. And he has the benefit of having a pretty private space to right. uh, appreciate okay. these works. So. Wow, John Steinbeck. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's really wild is I have the next paragraph highlighted. It's something I wanted to just oh, read. Wow. Go ahead. Uh, actually, Todd, oh, why don't you read sure. this for me? This room was swept and fairly neat, for Crooks was a proud, aloof man. He kept his distance and demanded that other people keep theirs. His body was bent over to the left by his crooked spine, and his eyes lay deep in his head, and because of their depth seemed to glitter with intensity. His lean face was lined with deep black wrinkles, and he had thin, pain-tightened lips, which were lighter than his face. Pain-tightened lips, man. That is a turn of phrase right there. That whole paragraph is so good at at giving us a description of this character, right? So that's Crooks, everybody. And he's rubbing liniment on his back. He has the shirt out of the back of his pants, and he's rubbing liniment on his back. And it's his private space, and white dudes don't come here. Right. And all of a sudden, Lenny shows up in the doorway. Yep. And uh, and so Crooks is not immediately okay with this because this is very different. And and I wasn't sure whether or not, I mean, obviously some level of Crooks not really wanting company, but I think there's maybe another level of not being comfortable with the idea of someone dropping by because it just didn't happen. Um, Crooks in this chapter... I, I, I talked last episode about how when characters were referring to Crooks and calling him the N-word, it was being done in a friendly way. And that's the way I felt then, but this chapter kind of conveys a, a situation where Crooks, we're reminded that Crooks is still kind of the bottom rung on the ladder and not really treated the same way as everybody else because he is the black guy here. And so... I do think part of his reluctance to to Lenny showing up on the doorstep is partly the fact that people just don't do that and he's uncomfortable with the idea of somebody wanting to engage with him. Lenny, on the other hand, I think is maybe somebody who just doesn't see color and distinction in the same way that everybody else here on the ranch does, right? Exactly. So Lenny's simple. He just sees people as people, doesn't understand the racial side of it, and crooks is simply uncomfortable with people being in his personal space. And so he starts yelling at Lenny and telling Lenny to leave. And Lenny just slowly lumbers his way into the room as Crooks pushes against it. But you can tell, even through the writing, there's just a reluctance in Crooks. Like, ultimately, everyone wants friends. Everyone wants people around. And next thing you know, Lenny is sitting down in the room. I think Crooks says something along the lines of, well, as long as you're in here, you may as well sit down, Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And so then Lenny sits on down and they have an exchange and Crook starts to realize that Lenny is simple. Yeah. And and speaks to how, like, I bet George talks to you all the time and says things that you don't fully understand. And Lenny's like, yep. And and so Crook starts to feel like a little bit of uh, mental superiority and then decides to play with that, use it as a toy. 
I mean, I get it. Like, Crooks has not had a good life. Yeah. And so there's a bitterness inside him that's understandable. And so he takes out And a I think there's an instinct, instinct if you're the one who's been punched at a lot, there is an instinct when you have the opportunity to be the one punching. For sure. Right. Bullies create bullies. Yeah. Right? I, I totally understand that. And so he starts to throw hypotheticals at Lenny. Like, what if George doesn't come back? Yes. Right? Uh, what if George never comes back? What if George dies? And this really scrambles Lenny's head because Lenny is so literal. He's like, who says this is going to happen, yeah. right? Like, yeah. he can't fully fathom the thoughts. He can't fully uh, process the thoughts. He gets that first layer of George not here, right? And then an anger that comes along with that. And Crooks enjoys this. Crooks enjoys uh, tormenting Lenny a little bit until... <laughs> well, Lenny gets a little bit uh, irate and, and physical about his concern because, yeah, Crooks is basically asking these hypotheticals of what if, but but Lenny, I think, is experiencing them as this is what's happening. We've It's not what if George doesn't come back. It's George isn't coming back. And that's leading to panic. That's leading to, and panic, of course, with Lenny leads to uh, lashing out. And uh, and that freaks Crooks out a little bit. Yeah, so Lenny gets up out of his chair and starts going, like, who's saying this is going to happen? Yeah. Like, quit yeah. manifesting things into my mind that I do not want to happen. And so uh, Crooks gets very small. Not as small and meek as he's going to get later, but Crooks gets small in his bed. Yep. Pulls himself up tight and is like, it's okay. It's just a joke. I was like, just supposing. Yeah, I was just supposing. I was just supposing. There you go. And so uh, and Lenny has a great line right there. Something along the lines of, hey, nobody's supposing George not coming back. You know, like, <laughs> That's right. Don't even be talking about that shit, basically. And then Candy enters the scene. Yes, because Candy has been doing more figuring. And by figuring, I mean like he's working out uh, the mathematical logistics about this farm that they're now planning on buying with their, their pooled resources. And he never gets into specifics about it, but uh, he talks about how he's figured about uh, how they can uh, make some money with the rabbits as well as not just have them for George to, sorry, for Lenny to, to take care of and play with. There's a way that they can turn rabbits into um, some kind of making money f profit for the farm as well. So Candy, who's the super old guy who's got some money, whose dog was just put and down. doesn't have one hand. And, and is missing a hand and has a stump that he's often scratching. Like yeah. basically constantly scratching in every scene that he's a part of. Uh, calls, out, um, calls out to Crooks out of sight trying to give Crooks his space. And calls out of sight and says, hey, have you seen Lenny? Yeah. And then Crooks is like, yeah, he's in here. And then uh, Candy only comes as far as the doorway and is respectful of Crooks' space. And Crooks says, well, as long as you're going to be standing in the doorway, you may as well come in kind of thing. And is fighting to hide his enthusiasm for having the people to hang with. And so what's really cool about it is that this very simple character, Lenny, is he's instantly like bridging people. Like he's, he's bringing people together. He, his... He's not, I don't even call it, like poisoned by the societal norms. Yeah, exactly. So so then he's allowing people to hang out that otherwise would feel they socially couldn't. Like yeah. it was so hard to get candy into Crook's room because of all these little silly social Social things. norms. So, and, yeah, and, yeah. These, this hierarchy and stuff. And it's so, uh, there's something really beautiful about that. There is a, there's a lesson there. There's something that, that I quite like. And so the conversation, as it turns to, um, you know, Candy having, you know, figured out about the rabbits. Now, Crooks is curious about the rabbits and what he's talking about. And, and so Candy kind of lets on about this idea about, about, about George and Lenny's dream of the farm and how they're going to go and do that. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, Crooks starts asking more and more questions. And I, I don't recall if it's now or later, but... At a certain point, it does begin to start appealing to crooks as well. And he's like, you know, like, if you're interested in having somebody who's willing to work just for their keep, just to just for a place to live, you know, and it's, on the one hand, as this was going on in the story, I'm like, this is, this was 
supposed to be kept quiet, right, between George and Lenny. Exactly. And bit by bit, the reach is expanding. But at the same time, I'm finding it really interesting how these people are so desperate that the the hint of something as simple as I can work there and 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 that's it. I, I make no money. I just have a place to live. But I'm not shit on like I am here on account of being an N word. Like just that tiniest bit of hope means so much to these people. And of course, that makes it harder when you realize that as this dream is expanding and encompassing more people, it's getting closer and closer to breaking and probably not happening. It just happening. feels that. Like, isn't that right? funny? You'd think that collectively, the more people involved, the better chances of it fulfilling. But it's not true. You can feel that. Like, that yeah. it's like a secret. And the more you share it, the less it'll be true, you know? And, and you can feel that happening in that scene. I read all of that and just thought about my own life and having a parcel of land and the freedom that comes Yeah, right. It. There is a freedom. What I call it is like freedom. They're all in some form of servitude. They're going to a farm and working for a person they don't like with an asshole son bullying them, living in a fucking bunkhouse with everybody else. Yeah. There's a freedom here and it's like, you can taste it, but you will never reach it, and it's it's in the, tough. In, this, in the case of this story too, though, it's it's almost literally a one to one of like I'm already doing this same work now. It's just not benefiting me. I'm yes. doing the same kind of work I'd be doing if I owned the land, but I'm doing it for this guy. I'm getting shit pay, and at the end of the month, I go and spend my shit pay in town at the whorehouse, and I come back and I fucking do it again, and that's life. And if you could just somehow break that cycle, you would be doing the same thing, but you would be benefiting yourself. And that's, I mean, I guess, in essence, that's kind of the core concept of the American dream. Exactly. Right? That, that you, you, you branch off and you do it for yourself and you succeed. You get a little parcel. Yeah. Especially in these days. So with this whole scene built, Curly's wife shows up. Yeah. Great timing for her to show up. Uh, of course, as always, she's looking for Curly, who's never around. Uh, uh, and also, as she points out, I guess that that Curly and the rest of the boys are in town. She's looking for everybody at this point. She's looking for Curly. Is she not or is she aware? Well, I think because she's the one who points out that they're That's all right. in town, right? That's so right? They've all gone to town because she brings that up. Like, You're right. um, yeah. you know, they're all whoring and whatever else and, and uh, um, yeah. Yeah. She is aware that Curly's hand has been damaged and has only heard the story that it was a piece of machinery and does not believe that story. Yeah, she has her doubts. Come here looking for the truth. Yeah. And uh, there is an interesting exchange here between her and Lenny that uh, uh, pretty much gives up the truth about what happened, right? Because she asks, I believe it's... um, the issue is that Lenny has bruises on him. That's what face. it is, yeah. Because at first, though, she asks Candy about, you know, how did he break his hand? Everybody's and saying the same thing. Everybody says the same thing. Broke it, broke it on machinery or whatever. Got it caught in machinery. And then she notices the bruises on Lenny's face. And she asks Lenny, how did you get those bruises? Yeah, and he goes And uh, he very sheepishly says he, he caught it in machinery. Yeah, good, got it in the machinery, right? And, and that's his response to how right. he got bruises on exactly. his face. And so, so that pretty much gives up the ghost right there of what happened. Yeah. Um, and it's at this point, too, as she's be, being a little bit manipulative and cruel towards Lenny, that Candy stands up to her with this kind of, um, we don't need you. Get out of here. We got a dream. You're we got wrecking a dream. our dream. We don't need you. We got a place. We're going to go do this thing. Yeah. We don't, and now the circle has expanded even further. <laughs> right. Now candy and is And this is beans. where I was like, oh, man, things are going to go bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, you don't, because they still, at this point, need this next 30 days of work. They got to get through that month to get the, the month end pay. Yeah, now they're getting cocky about and a dream. they're getting cocky now. And yeah. Candy's like, we don't need you. We could just go right now if we want to. And it's like, yee. Those chickens have not had. Those chickens have not hatched, exactly. Um, but she's pretty nonplussed. She's not particularly concerned about Candy's, you know, oh, we don't need you. She's like, whatever. 
You always have needed us. She is quite impressed that someone took her round out of Curly. She's quite happy that with that. That is true. That is true. She does point out that, uh, well, I guess it's probably in the next chapter that she talks about how Curly's not a great husband. But Right. But at this point, she is impressed and has an understanding that Lenny uh, sent her husband to the hospital, and she's okay with that. Um, yeah. And so about the time that they're done with uh, Mrs. Curly, it's, uh, I believe it's somebody says, I don't remember who it is, um, but they said that they heard the, the men coming back. George shows up. It's before that, though. It's it's because they because there's a sense in the chapter that they might be pulling her leg, that they might be saying that they heard the men come back just to get rid of her, uh, right? Okay. Because she's like, I didn't hear them, and and uh, and somebody says like, well, if you're not sure they're here, maybe take the the the, the safe way home. That way, Curly won't see that you've been here. And so she does, just to play it safe, because she's where she's not supposed to be, she does depart and, uh, and head home. Uh, and then you're right, I think George does show up after that. Yeah. Yeah, George shows up, and, uh, and uh, Candy tells him about the, the calculations about the rabbits, how they can make money. Uh, and George is like, what the fuck? I told you not to tell anybody. As they're leaving, Crooks is like, guys... I changed my mind. I don't want to be a part of it. And that's that was a really interesting moment, too, because I, I'm not sure what his motivation to say that was. Do you think that after the confrontation with Curly's wife, that Crooks had a sense that this dream was destined for failure? Yeah, so there, there's something that happened during that scene between Crooks and Curly's wife. Mm. And what happened is that... Yes, I forgot about that. Um, so she, you know, she's asking, uh, who's George? That little guy you come with? And Lenny smiled happily. That's him. He said, that's the guy, and he's going to let me tend the rabbits. Well, if that's all you want, I might get a couple rabbits myself. And with that, Crooks stood up from his bunk and faced her. I've had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights coming in a colored man's room. You got no rights messing around here at all. Now you just get on out. Get out quick. And if you don't, I'm going to ask the boss not to ever let you come in the barn no more. She turned on him in scorn. Listen, N-word, she said. You know what I can do to you if you open your trap? Crook stared hopelessly at her, and then he sat down on his bunk and drew himself in. She closed on him. You know what I could do? Crook seemed to grow smaller, and he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. Well, you keep your place then, N-word. I could get you strung up on a tree so easy it ain't even funny. Yeah, a reminder that um, the life of an average black person at this time was pretty, uh, pretty easy to throw away. Crooks had reduced himself to nothing. There was no personality, no ego, nothing to arouse either like or dislike. He said, yes, ma'am. And his voice was toneless. For a moment, she stood over him as though waiting for him to move so that she could whip at him again. But Crook sat perfectly still, his eyes averted, everything that might be hurt drawn in. She turned at last to the other two. It's intense, man. Yeah. And yeah, that's a fair point because I think maybe his his reason for backing out of the the um, the farm dream at the end of the chapter is that he's had his power removed. He's now back to being, uh, you know, the N word stable buck, uh, a, a, a lowly being, uh, and, and probably doesn't at that moment feel like he has any agency over his own life. You know, that was that was I for, I forgot about that exchange. That was dark. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a tough scene. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Candy, Lenny, and George leave Crooks to his, uh, to his room. Crooks goes back to rubbing the liniment on his back. That's the end of the chapter. And then... Then we, we get to the barn finally. Time has passed. Yeah. And we open on a barn piled high with straw at one end. Mm-hmm. 
and Lenny sitting near the base of that pile with a small dead puppy. With his puppy. Um, the one thing I found myself thinking just now as I was flipping through the previous chapter, uh, the previous chapter opened with Lenny saying that the reason he was outside of, of Crook's room and just milling around was because he had been told not to not to spend too much time with the pups because he could kill them and whatever else. I wonder whether or not at that point he had already killed the puppy and he didn't know what to do about it. Still doesn't know what to do about it in this chapter, but like maybe he had left the barn because he realized he had killed the puppy and didn't know what to do after uh, at some point after leaving, you know, Crooks's room, maybe it's the next day, a couple of days, goes back to the barn to find the dead puppy. I don't know. I'm just wondering when the puppy died. All we know at the at the start of this chapter is that the puppy is now dead. We don't know when it died. Yeah, Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. Because Lenny hides this puppy in the straw later in the scene and is unsure what to do with it, I'm thinking it just happened. Yeah, fair. That makes sense. Yep. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay, out of sight. But he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, this ain't no bad thing like I got to go hide in the brush. Oh, no, this ain't. I'll tell George I found it dead. And then he unburies and expects it, and he's playing with this yeah. dead puppy. Which, I mean, he was playing with dead mice, so, I mean, that's to be expected. He doesn't, he just wants to, you know, pet a thing and and enjoy how soft it is. And, and you know, and he's not probably willing to accept what he did. He can see it's dead. He knows it's dead. He knows he did something wrong. He's trying to deal with it. But at the same time, he doesn't want to stop petting it. He enjoys that experience, and he enjoys the warmth, maybe not the the physical warmth of a body that's now cooling, but the just the the warmth of having a living thing near you. Well, I guess it's not a living thing anymore either. Anyway, you know I, what I'm saying. I think there's just a tactile sense to it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. He likes the soft fur. Um, we're gonna discuss this later, I believe, but uh, I believe that he has like extreme autism. <laughs> Something oh, something. He's got something. Yeah. For so sure. there's yeah. just this obsession with texture. Yeah. And uh, he's aware that he's done something wrong and he's going to get in trouble for it. And he feels bad, but on a very surface level. Yeah. On a very surface level. He's not fully grasping. Oh, no. Because, I mean, his biggest concern at this point is, is that George won't let him take care of the rabbits. That's he, uh, it. Suddenly his anger arose. God damn you, he cried. Why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. Yeah, that's that's ultimately the source of his grief, not understanding that, I mean, he understands that what he did was wrong, but I don't think he understands the the depth or the meaning behind the wrongness. The wrongness only exists as a as in relation to being able to tend the rabbits, right? I know this is wrong because I'm not going to be allowed to tend the rabbits if George finds out. So his initial thought is, you know, whether or not he's going to tell George, whether or not he should bury the pup and hope that maybe they forget how many pups there were or just assume something happened to it. Right. He's got all kinds of different options he's got right now. And then Curly's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly at her. She said, what do you got there, sonny boy? And so, of course, this dead puppy is revealed. Yeah. And and Lenny really doesn't want to talk to her. He's been told by George not to have anything to do with her. And he does kind of say that to her a few times. Um, George says, I ain't to have nothing to do with you. Talk to you or nothing. And she's like, I get lonely, she said. You can talk yeah. to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly, else he gets mad. How'd you like to not to talk to anybody? And I'm really reminded uh, of the previous scene with Crooks, who felt the same way, you know? 
all these social structures isolating people from each other. You know, I'm, I'm so glad uh, myself personally nowadays, I talk to friggin' everybody, you know, and I'm so glad that that doesn't exist in our country. Well, you don't society. have an overbearing feels, husband or an overbearing boss who's this, putting those kind of social restrictions on you. You know what? It feels like high school, right? right. Those yeah. social structures were in high school, and what a terrible, terrible thing right, to, yeah. to be rigidly stuck. You're not allowed stuck. to talk to the jocks because yeah, you're a nerd or exactly, whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right? It feels like that, and uh, I'm glad we've kind of ascended those social structures. Yay! Uh, and so now we get a little bit of uh, Mrs. Lenny's, or sorry, Mrs. Curley's backstory. She wanted to be in the pictures. She retells her own lies to herself. She has two lies that she likes to tell herself over and over, that she's deserving of this better life. Mm -hmm. and, and those two lies are. What are they? I don't know. What? Well, the two lies are that, you know, well, it's it's not a lie that some guy said, hey, I can put you in the pictures or yeah. not. It's just that some dude probably was just oh, looking yeah, no, to totally. get laid or right, whatever, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you have to believe in the lie to a certain degree for that to be like a possible future outside of the one you chose for yourself. Yeah, but I mean, she's convinced of this, though. She's convinced that yes. had it not been for, you know, she should have been famous. She should have been in the movies. And, and in her mind, like, that, that, it was barely even work. Like, I would go to the openings, and they would take pictures of me, and then that's all that they would do. And then, like, that was my life. And It could have been could her have life. Been and, I mean, it, it really draws back to how, like, George is kind of telling a lie to Lenny, this idea yeah, of the fair. farm, right? And they're all sold on this, on this potential. They're lying to themselves about this potential farm in the same way uh, that this uh, woman, uh, Curly's wife, who – has the best stature in the place. She doesn't have to work all day. She has whatever she wants. She can get done up. And yet she's also lonely. And and she's also telling herself a lie about another life she could have had. Yeah. And I really love that. That from the lowliest to the highest, everyone is a little disillusioned. Yeah. And there's something poetic about that. And she confesses that she doesn't like Curly either. Um, which I think we all kind of knew. Yeah, I mean, but she spends no time around the guy. To so. to have it spelled out, you know, is 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 an interesting element of her character. Like it's one thing to secretly and maybe even unconsciously dislike your husband in a way that you would never vocally admit. You just kind of avoid him. But to literally come out to Lenny, and I guess maybe Lenny is safe in that. He's probably not going to remember what she said five minutes after she said it. So he certainly can't go and confess anything to Curly. But it's still interesting to have her basically literally say, um, I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fella. Right. Exactly. And so there's a bit of a mild flirtation. They're moving a little closer and further away from each other. I mean, it's really just that she's a lonely person and he's receptive because he's simple. Yeah. Right. I think he's kind of like a a fairly calm pool of water. You kind of get to see yourself in him and just, and just speak. And, and, uh, you know, there's not a malicious bone in his body, despite the fact that he kills a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so she talks about how, um, I think maybe it starts with Lenny talking about how he liked petting the puppy and, and they talk about, uh, how it is nice to like to touch soft things. And, and, you know, she's like, oh, of course. I mean, you know, velvet and silk, those things are, are nice to touch. They feel nice. And my hair, my hair is, is so soft because I, you know, I brush it constantly and that keeps it fine and soft. And she, she kind of invites Lenny to, to just touch her hair, which she does. Right. But Lenny being Lenny is a bit aggressive about it. And so I've got something for you to read. Oh, goody. I bet I know what we're doing here. And, to the, and it goes into the next page from there. Oh, boy. Okay. How do I turn the page? Uh, just a swipe to the left will do it. Okay. I love you. I just want to, I just close my eyes and listen to this. <laughs> you guys, uh, uh, in listening, I invite you to do the same. All right. Uh, just be aware. It's probably going to get ugly. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you muss it up, she said. Lenny said, oh, that's nice. And he stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Look out now, you'll muss it up. And then she cried angrily, You stop it now, you'll mess it up. She jerked her head sideways and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. 
She screamed then, and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that. George will be mad. She struggled violently under his hands. Her feet battered on the hay, and she writhed to be free. And from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George gonna say I done a bad thing. He ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits. He moved his hand a little, and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You're going to get me in trouble, just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. And he continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said. And he shook her, and her body flopped like a fish. And then she was still, for Lenny had broken her neck. Fuck. Fuck. Right? What's wild to me is that... They got stormed out of the town weed over him grabbing this woman's dress, and I felt like it was an overreaction, that this town overreacted. I can't believe he had to leave town and that she freaked out over a little dress grab, right? And... <laughs> the train, yeah. And we're at the Coleman's Clubhouse! It's got trains! <sighs> That's the Death Star, by the way. Oh, the Death Star, okay. It is the Death Star, and those are two blue snowflakes crisscrossing, and that's a uh, red Vader helmet and green Yoda face oh, going up and down okay. over it. I know. I, I think the blue snowflakes is so silly. I want to break it open and see if I can turn the blue snowflakes into TIE Fighter and uh, an X-Wing. See, what I would do, I, li I like the snowflakes. If I was going to ditch anything, I would trade the Vader and Yoda for the TIE Fighter and X-Wing. No, I'd make them all four ships. All four ships in a, a ship battle. Yeah. Over the X-Wing, over the I Death like the Star. Snowflakes, because it's the one part that's seasonal, right? Because uh, it's seasonal. <laughs> Why can't you have seasonal Star Wars? Do you have that up all the time, or just, just for Christmas? <laughs> just for Christmas. So keep the snowflakes, turn the red one into a TIE fighter, yeah. and the green one into an X-Wing, totally. and you really got something. Yeah. Because, again, it's, it's like you've got... You've got the, the they're flying all of it's flying over the Death Star. Snowflakes fly. I mean yeah. they'll fly fly, but they drift down. They can be drifting down by the Death Star. And then you're your space and snowflakes. Space snowflakes. Space snowflakes. <laughs> space snowflakes. <laughs> In space, no snowflake can melt. That's right. That's so true. <laughs> That's funny. Well, unless they get near like a heated gas ball. Yeah, no, if like if like the Death Star ball like fired its death beam right at yeah, the snowflake. Right. Fucked, Every time but. it's like we only have snowflakes on non <laughs> non death ray days. Uh and so Curly's wife is killed. Yes. In a a very similar incident to him just grabbing a woman's dress. And so... But you see, it makes me wonder, it does make me wonder whether or not the when, uh, when Lenny grabbed the girl's dress in weed, whether that was a bit more serious than it was described as. Oh, it definitely right? was now, right? Yeah, and I love that subtext. Like, that's really cool just to be able to, like, think back to previous scenes and, and discuss, uh, yeah... The connotations added by what comes later. Yeah. That's very cool. But I was expecting, when he first put his hand over her mouth, I was expecting a suffocation death um, that he was just going to keep trying to keep her from screaming. <laughs> and um, <laughs> They took it to the John Steinbeck. Well, yeah. Went to the top row. Again, though, that idea of that this guy is so big and, and, and unaware of his own power that he literally could just be like shaking this girl to like make her be quiet. And that's enough to snap her neck. Yeah, just a little shush snap. Right? Like, I don't think, I mean, I don't want to try on you because if I accidentally did it, that would suck. But right. like, I think most of us, if we just grabbed somebody by the mouth and the back of the head and shook them a bit, we're not going to accidentally break their no, neck. No, but I've met men that could. Okay, fair enough. There you go. And Lenny would be one of that's them. That's right. For sure, yeah. I was once in a hotel room with my band and these two drunk dudes in the hallway just walked into our room and one of them was effing huge. Yeah. And I just tried to like, I'm the front man of the band, tried to take over the room like, Kate, you got to go. And I put my arm on his bicep and just tried to push him out of the room. And it was a fucking wall of stone. Right. And he just looked at, down at me and he went, that's an interesting approach. <laughs> 
That was it. It was, uh, I'm so glad my six foot something bass player, who's an old man, yeah, yeah. stepped in because there was some sort of like fatherly influence to right, get these fucking right. dudes out of my Sometimes room. Sometimes that's what you need is you need the my elder, goodness. the respect of an elder. Yeah, to, that's, yeah. a, that's a unique approach. <laughs> I, was like, I love oh. that line. Yeah, it's just, it was so good, man. It was so priceless. I'll never forget. I can forget. see like uh, uh, that, that scene playing out in a movie with like Dave Batista as that guy, yeah, right? Exactly. That would be so good. It was just like random hallway <laughs> hotel. Guy. Right. Frig around. So now we have a dead, uh, a dead Mrs. Curly. So Lenny knows what to do in case of emergency. Right, because they talked about it in the first chapter. He's got to go. Head to swamp. Yeah. Hide in swamp. Yeah. In this, you know, hide next to the river, yeah. down the road from the camp. This is what you do in case of emergency: break glass, run for your life down yeah. to this specific spot. So off he goes. So off he goes. Um, some amount of time after that, it's not really clear. Uh, Candy shows up at the barn. George shows up on his heels. Well, Candy first makes the discovery. Yes. He shows up, he makes the discovery, realizes that she's dead. And Can George. George shows up. Then George shows up. Correct. And then Candy and George go, okay, well, George, you can't be part of finding this because you'll immediately be linked to it. Well, I think George is the one who says, I can't be part of finding right. this. Right. Yeah, He's that like, would make sense. I'm going to go back to the, to the bunkhouse. And, and you wait a couple of minutes and then come back and let everybody know. That way it doesn't look like I was part of this because it's so obviously Lenny. Yeah. It's so obviously Lenny. And because of the relationship between George and Lenny, if if they think that he was even remotely involved, he's going to get strung up too. So um, so off George goes back to the bunkhouse. Um, Candy goes back to the bunkhouse at that point, tells them what he found. And now kind of everybody at this point comes out to the barn to find um, Curly's wife, uh, again, still dead in the hay. Uh, at some point during that exchange, uh, George still stared at Curly's wife, says, uh, Lenny never done it in meanness, he said. All the time he done bad things, but he never done one of them mean. And ain't that the truth? That's the truth. It's still the truth. Yeah, I mean, it was just... <sighs> You know, you, you look at that situation and it's like, is there something that George could have said or done that could have prepared Lenny for that situation better? Because it's like, you know, a lot of the, the, the murder, mm. really, it comes out of panic, right? A panic about what happened in Weeds and a, and a replaying of that. A panic of George telling you not to get in trouble, not to talk to this woman. Um, there's probably an element of, shit, I already fucked up by killing this puppy. Now I fucked up by making this woman want to scream. How do I How do I just reset all of these things and get everything back to normal? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, like the absolute absence of maliciousness here is is so vital to understanding what's going on and the complexity of it, right? Uh, what I think it really helps you understand is just uh, the social restrictions. I think that's what does it all. Like the conversations that you and I have as friends didn't occur back then in the same way. The just the social restrictions, everybody not truly being themselves, right? Crooks not being able to admit that he wants people in his place. Uh, just the, Curly's wife not being able to just express what she wants from life. I think that the social restrictions on everybody create these situations where you can't have the earnest conversations around mental illness. That's part of it. You know? um, but there's also the fact that, you know, Lenny has intellectual um, restrictions as well. 100%. And that's a huge problem for, for how he's trying, how, how he's surviving and his ability to survive. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Curly basically wants to hunt Lenny down. Candy goes and finds everybody, gets them to yeah. the barn. Uh, they get into the barn. Uh, Slim, of course, cool cool Luke Slim there, hops over, checks the body. No pulse. Curly came suddenly to life. I know who done it, he cried. That big son of a bitch done it. I know he done it. But everybody else was out there playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm going to get him. I'm going to go in for my shotgun. I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, you guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger. And then he went out too, which is an important plot point. It is. Because Carlson goes to get that Luger and... It's missing. 
Yeah, and why is it missing, Todd? Well, he suspects it's because uh, Lenny stole it when he escaped. Right. That ain't so, though. That ain't so. Well, spoilers much. <laughs> hey, if you got this far, you're you're all okay with them. You're all right with them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, we're... Uh, they suspect that Lenny took it, but I, I think that's mostly because they're they're not seeing Lenny as Lenny is. They're seeing Lenny as this kind of violent, uh, angry force. And so they think that he would grab the gun in order to defend himself now that he's killed Curly's wife. When I, I don't know if, if Lenny would even necessarily know how to use a gun. Um, but yeah, and I think the fact that Curly is calling for uh, Lenny to be shot in the guts. I feel like that's also an important point too for what happens in the last chapter. He would have went south, he says. This is George talking. He came from north, so we would have went south. I guess we got to get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Can we maybe bring him in and they'll lock him up? He's not Slim. He didn't do this to be mean. We might, he said, but if we could keep Curly in, we might. But Curly's going to want to shoot him. Curly's still mad about his hand. And yep. suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know, says George. I know. So George is still hopeful that. He's understanding, though. He's he's seeing he's seeing what's going to come bargaining. down. It's bargaining. It's bargaining, right? It's bargaining. And it is it is hoping that there's a way that this can be dealt with that doesn't end in Lenny's death. Um, you know, maybe we can get him in jail. Maybe we can find some way because it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. Like you, like you said, it wasn't meanness. It wasn't, there was nothing inherently cruel about anything that Lenny has ever done, even when the end result was people being hurt or animals being hurt or whatever. But yeah, I think he sees the, the way the tables are turning or however you want to phrase it. And so we end up back at that creek. Yep. Along the bank uh, with Lenny, uh, having drank a bit from the pool, sitting on the edge of the bank, knees pulled up to his chest, chin on his knees. And George shows up. Waiting. And George shows up. And so the first thing Lenny wants from George is to get um, to get the criticism from George out of the way. Like, aren't you gonna aren't you gonna give me shit, basically? Um and George is really reluctant to. And he, he goes through the motions because he knows it's what Lenny kind of needs to hear. But it's it's kind of half-assed. It's just like, you know, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. Blah, 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 blah. And then Lenny's like, well, aren't you going to say any more? And George is like, no, no, I think that's kind of enough. Lenny said, George, yeah. Ain't you going to give me hell? Give you hell? Sure, like you always done, like. Yeah. If I didn't have to tell you, I'd have my 50 bucks. Jeez, Christ, Lenny. And you remember every word I say. Well, ain't you going to say it? George shook himself. He said, woodenly, if I was alone, I could live so easy. He was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess, he said. Go on, said Lenny. And when the end of the month come, and when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house, he said again. Lenny finds comfort in these kind of repetitive uh, routines. Yes. In these repetitive stories, he likes hearing the, the same thing. Yeah. You know, even even if it means that in this case he did bad, uh, he needs that routine of being told, being given hell. Uh, he needs that in order to process and move on. Having done that, um, now George sort of tells him to look off into the distance. Look across the river. Uh, you know, so that you could almost see it and I'll describe, you know, our our farm to you. Yeah, exactly. And then he reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety. And the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head at the place where the spine and skull were joined. Whew. And we get towards that scene. And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. I like that. Uh, one thing you kind of, I think, 
just barely skipped over in your reading of that is that there is this growing tension of the 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 sound of of Curly and the rest of the the mob is getting louder. Yeah, that's There's right. There's this sense that George only has so much time to deal with this Correct. situation. Yes. George falters at one point. He raises the gun and then puts it down again. Yes. Um, and it's this this feeling of and I do think that the the fact that um, Curly is intending to shoot Lenny in the guts, which is a it's fucking terrible, long, terrible, painful low, way to die. Yeah, slow. Um, George is trying, has at this point embraced the fact that Lenny's not going to live. Uh, and he's trying to offer the the most peaceful way out as possible. Yep. Matching the way Candy's dog was put down. Yep. Um, giving Lenny that last picture of their fantasy together. Yep. Uh, before before pulling the trigger at that moment where he can no longer put it off without running the risk of of uh, Curly getting here and and making things worse, worse for Lenny. Correct. And so George does the unthinkable and sends him off. Yeah. And everyone else arrives, takes a look at the body, yep. and eventually Slim says, hey, George, let's go get a drink in town. Yep. And George and Slim go get a drink in town because Slim gets it. I uh, absolutely love the final paragraph in this book. We talked about this. We're going to read the final paragraph of any book. I think you should read the last two paragraphs, but leave a little space so we understand because this last par it's a line. The last line of this book is really important, I think. Mm -hmm. Slim said, you had it, George. I swear you had a. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them, and Carlson said, Now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? That's so great. Carlson had the Luger. Carlson was the guy who had no issue taking that dog out to pasture and shooting in the back of the head. And just the flippantness of that, and the way it feels like a line that belongs in the middle of something, it doesn't feel... Ultimate, it doesn't feel like a big end cap to anything. I like that. I yeah. like that about it. I like yeah. how it just it it lessens the importance of everything that came before it in a way that I think is important. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of of inhumanity in this story. Yeah. A Maybe lot of a uh not not intolerance really. There's just a lot of inconsideration. A lot of people not caring about each other, um, and and that's a line that that caps it off. The uncaring world that they were yeah. living in. The fact that onlookers would be like, "What's that all about?" I don't even understand why they'd be upset. I, the, the one thing that, that that does strike me with that line is, I I think it's a little ridiculous that Carlson wouldn't catch why George was impacted by Lenny's death. I could see why he might be like, well, I don't know why Slim cares. Like, who the fuck is Lenny to Slim? But it does seem a little odd that yeah, he doesn't get why George... And maybe that's the point. That is the point. Yeah. The fact that this Carlson character doesn't understand why George and Slim would have an issue with what just went down in this. Yeah. Uh, and this Carlson guy also took out that dog. That's, that's like Carlson... It represents like the cruelty of that time period of the of the uncaring the world doesn't really care right like the earth doesn't care it's yeah. it's memory is long and the lives of humans are unimportant and it's that it's that element that i i get out of his the way he speaks and and just uh, this through line this feeling the dread that carries through the entire thing is almost voiced in that statement like who so someone What's the big dies. Deal? What's the big deal? Yeah. People die, right? There'll be more ranch hands here tomorrow. There'll be more ranch hands here tomorrow. He was a nuisance. He was a dog yeah, that needed right. to be put outside, right? And so that I don't know. I don't know. It's it man. It's something. It's representing something that feels very powerful for how throwaway it is. It feels like a very throwaway line that doesn't belong at the end. And because of that, there's an extra impact to it that I can't fully articulate. One other thing that we didn't uh, touch on when we were talking about the last chapter, and that was potentially my fault to some degree because I forgot exactly where it fell, but there was a conversation between Candy and George uh, after after sort of realizing what Lenny's done and how Lenny is probably not going to make it about the farm and about whether or not 
they're still going to follow through on that dream. Right. Because Candy's still like, look, like I've got, I've still got the money. He's the money guy, right? He's the one that could make this happen very soon. And just because Lenny's not around, he's like, we're still going to do this, right? And George is basically not interested anymore. I think George sees that there's going to be further ramifications from these actions, that it shatters the dream or something. So I think, yeah, I mean, there, there's, yeah, I've got a few. That, that George is going to, George, I think he says as much. George says, like, nah, I'm going to take my money. I'm going to go to the whorehouse. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I'm about to fuck my shit up after this. Yeah. This is going to emotionally affect me to the point where I'm going to become a zombie yeah. who works on this farm, fucks his shit up when he can. Yeah. That's my future now for a while. And I, I wonder, like, a lot of that obviously comes not just from, from Lenny's death directly, but... You want some wine? Interrupting our podcast. Is there we, for- we interrupt this podcast for wine. Those sweet fucking red grapes, man. Obviously, the fact that, that Lenny's dead and George is, you know sad, regretful about that, etc. But I think there's also a larger element of of there's a, an aimlessness to him now that he doesn't have Lenny to take care of. 100%. There's no, there's no long-term goal. There's no, almost no meaning in his life anymore. Yeah. And, and, and he can just settle into this meaningless existence of work and whoring and work and whoring and work and whoring. Like um, the rest of us. Like the rest of us. Uh, how little things have changed. Um, and it's it's sad. Yeah. Lenny brought a positive energy to the world. Mm. He did. He really did. Like I said, he brought people together. And, uh, I mean, due to a lack of mental health support and understanding and social restrictions and constructs, none of this could last. Yep. And so it ends tragically. And I think that it opened pretty tragically. Let's be honest. This yeah. was tragic from beginning to end. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, it didn't hide how it was going to end. You no. know, it let you know from the start what you were getting yourself into and the kind of tonality you were going to receive from its story. I really liked it. I really liked the whole thing. Um, should it have been banned anywhere ever? Is it bannable anywhere? Like, does it ever. belong in a high school? You put this uh, in a high school. I say probably. High school library, no problem? Oh, high school library, no problem. Yeah. All right. Um, curriculum, I think, so, so first of all, I would think like in any sort of writing class, uh, this should be on the curriculum. Huh. Yeah, I think for sure. there's maybe, in my experience at least, no better example of how to create so many important elements of a story in such yep. a concise way. Yeah, like I'm thinking with 150 pages ish, right? Like teach this to kids, man. We got short attention spans. Yeah, not that I'm a right. A kid but I mean, anymore. there's so much about like how do you, how do you um, how do you create and establish characters? How do you create and establish setting? How do you create tension? How do you create stakes? Like all of these very basic elements of drama can be pulled from this and it's so fucking short. Like it yeah. is such a master class in doing so much proper with your writing yeah. in a really tiny amount of time. You can smell it, you can feel it, yeah. you're there in a big way. And I would say that like in a, in a classroom where you're talking about the, the history of the Great Depression, I think it's a fantastic read for that as well yeah. because it, yeah. it personalizes the kind of information that you're getting from a textbook. You know, a textbook can give you like, you know, details and specifics and things like that. But it, I think it falters at personalizing the environment. At putting you in it, I think. Yeah. I think that this puts you there. Immersing, yes. Immersion. There's an immersion into a certain era and yeah. time and mindset uh, from this, for sure, that I believe existed. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm glad it's represented here. Me too. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I totally understand why this is you know, considered a, a great piece of American literature. 100%. You know, one of the the, the classics of American literature. Agreed. Um, the one thing I did want to share from uh, the, the, the history of this book that I thought was very interesting. Uh, in the introduction to Penguin's 1994 edition of the book, Susan Schillinglaw writes that Steinbeck, after dropping out of Stanford, spent almost two years roaming California finding work on ranches for Spreckles Sugar, where he would harvest wheat and sugar beets. 
Steinbeck told the New York Times in 1937, I was a bindle stiff myself for quite a spell. I worked in the same country that the story is laid in. The characters are composites to a certain extent. Lenny was a real person. He's in an insane asylum in California right now. I worked alongside him for many weeks. He didn't kill a girl. He killed a ranch foreman. Got sore because the boss had fired his pal and stuck a pitchfork right through his stomach. I hate to tell you how many times I saw him do it. We couldn't stop him until it was too late. Holy shit! That's insane, right? man. That's fucking insane. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, which which segs well into this. So uh, Howard Fisher, who's an MD, retired as a professor of pediatrics from Wayne State University School of Medicine, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he wrote an article about what affliction Lenny may have. Oh, okay. And uh, discusses several things here, like a Sotos syndrome. Uh, which are average six feet in height, although there's two reports of men with this condition who are more than seven feet tall. Wow. Um, large hands and feet, below average intelligence with 98.7% of them, and speech problems. Uh, clumsy, having an awkward gait, and about half of those affected have seizures. Um, it's the deletion of the NSD1 gene, whatever the heck that is. So in autism or the spectrum, language and reciprocal social behaviors are more affected than nonverbal reasoning skills. So anyway, in diagnosing the fictional character Lenny Small, he says he believes that Lenny most likely has Soto syndrome. The this tall stature shouldn't change that. Soto syndrome includes intellectual defects, which can be severe in 20%. He likes to pet soft things. Also, though, another writer proposes that Lenny is Lenny Small because Steinbeck wanted to tell the reader that Lenny is subject to petite mal attacks of epilepsy. And very few people with Soto syndrome have those. So in an absence of those, the most likely, most likely autistic meltdowns represent a more likely possibility. So he may ha have autism, which is kind of what I'm feeling. I'm feeling I, an autistic vibe. I do feel like the, the, the guy saying that like the Lenny Small was meant to imply petite mal seizures is kind of out there. That's a little too far. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's possible, but I mean, Soto to syndrome. Me, it is to me. Small was just like an interesting irony of of, of the, his character, the absolute truth of what he was. Right, right. He was not a small person. Ah, that's um, that's, that's enough, right? Yeah, I, that's I, that's, that's what I would take. Yeah, I don't okay. I don't think. Yeah, I recommend this book. I absolutely do as well. I think everyone should read this. It's like 150 pages. It's, it's not, less than that. It's like, not a big e burn. It's like 80, 92, 92 there you pages go. for Boom. E See, I don't know. I'm yeah. making it up. Uh, it's an easy read. You can read this in a week, like casually. You can read it in two days cash. You can read it in six days, super cash. That's right. Read you can one read chapter it. a day. You can and read you it. You can read it in less than a week. You can read it in three months, super <laughs> so cash. That's like looking at just, one sentence just a day. Five, just a sentence a day. You'll I get mean, there. That's, a, that's maybe a fair super way to approach it. But you might want to refresh your memory as you go along. Yeah, that's probably not right. Yeah. But like, I knocked out the first part in a day, and I knocked out the second part in a day. Each 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 half of it I read in a day. Yeah, couldn't help it. It wasn't hard to do. So uh, highly recommend it. Don't know why it's banned. It's awesome. Way to go, Steinbeck. That dude's still alive? No, no. I don't think so. We would assume not. If he's writing in the 30s, yeah, because he'd he, be nah, like 120 yeah, be, or yeah, something. Like, he would be like in his at least his 20s in the 30s. So, and probably in his 30s in the 30s because he had been in his 20s. 10 years earlier when he was a bindle stiff. Um, it's, you would be 95 years old right now. Yeah. We're about to find out now, everybody. He's dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, sure. we, what we should be doing is betting, betting on when he died. Uh, he died in 92, 87. I'm, oh, I was going to say 85. Ooh, I'll take 92 then. Oh, shit, man. 68. We're way out. Whoa! Dude died way back. Yeah. He was old as shit already when he was writing his novels. Do you want to look at, uh, man, he looked like he saw some shit, though. Man, isn't that the picture of an author? We're looking at a black and white photo of Steinbeck right now, and that dude looks like he writes books. <laughs> what did he die? He's got a mustache. Of. Not that it matters, but. Looks very distinguished with a mustache. Slightly, re just like receding That's a good face. Mustache. It is. It's a quality mustache. Heart disease and congestive heart failure. He was 66. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of fun. And as writers do. Long smoker, yeah. Yeah. Todd, do writers have a lot of fun? Uh, no. <laughs> he burps into the mic. <laughs> nope. 
<laughs> no, there's a lot of sadness and alone time when you're writing. But with alcohol. There is, yeah, sadness and alone time with alcohol, so yeah. that's fair, yeah. yeah. Write drunk, edit sober is what they say. Uh, he had a nearly a complete occlusion of the main coronary artery, so that's... Uh, man liked his French fries. Man liked his French fries. <laughs> okay, you gotta man, love a man with convictions. <laughs> All right, that was uh, of Mice and Men. Uh, we're going to do a live wrap-up of this at some point. We should watch some movies first. We should watch some movies first. Let's I watch agree. two at least. We should watch two of the movies, maybe the oldest one and the newest one. Let's do that. Uh, I like that we idea. And then we can talk about how well the movies portrayed the book. And I also want to spend a little bit more time talking specifically about why it was banned. It is the N-word, but there's also more than the N-word, apparently, as well. So, um, Ooh, yeah. tune in next time. Yeah. So uh, we will be announcing the live episode on our Facebook stuff, so you can look for it there. This may not have to be on a live, yeah, episode. On a live episode. I'm just realizing now, but I'm the one who phones in harasses live episodes. Hi, if you've ever been a host of this podcast, you must now fucking phone in on the live episode and harass me. You've been told. We'll get Carlo or Oren to call in. Both. Yeah. They both, both have to. Both, I'm, exactly. Shots fired, motherfuckers. Join <laughs> us on the live episode. I've been doing it for you guys. There we go. Yeah, that's the shots Shots fired from Dave. <laughs> Can you guys bring it? That's right. We'll find out in a few weeks' time. All right. Woo. Thanks for listening. Uh, man, I dug this book a lot. Um, Me too. I've been talking And your company. I've, oh. really, I've really enjoyed this whole thing. Thanks. I've enjoyed doing Thanks this with Todd. you. This is the first time that we've done a multi-part podcast. Uh, it's the first time I've had to read had to for your read, podcast. You know, you had to yeah. to actually like spend some time with some literature. Fuck that shit, right? Man, what a non rock and roll thing to do with your time. I know. I just want to like interact with digital spaces on right. the controller. Well, we can go play some Fortnite now. Okay, thank right. you. Thanks again, Dave. Thank uh, you. I've been Todd Sullivan. I've been Dave Coleman. Uh, check out Mysteries and Madness. Sixteen episodes out there. Todd Sullivan is Detective Jack Shepard. Yes, I am solving uh, Cthulhu-drenched cases in a radio drama filled with forty hours of foley per one hour episode. Check it out. It takes a lot of work. Do it. Mysteries and Madness. Check it out. Honestly, it's, it's going to be legit. It's, if you've not listened to it, it is unlike anything you've heard. It's it fucking is, legit. It's it's a radio drama, but improvised dialogue and 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 improvised storytelling, and it's just mwah, chef kiss of of digital entertainment. Yeah, man, I like that stuff, and it's it's pretty cool, and not enough people listen to it for sure. Uh, and this has been uh, when bad things happen to good people. Uh huh. Uh, until next time, make sure you check out blah 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 media. That's blah 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 media dot com if you want to check out more. Also, do you want to say our tagline? Go read a motherfucking book. <laughs>